Exodus chapter 25, we're going to read the last verse of the chapter, which is a summary of God's words to Moses concerning the construction of the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 40. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. See that you make them after the pattern for them which was shown to you on the mountain. These are amazing words because it's not what you think would be the case when God set up his place of worship where he would meet with the people. Because if you take a worldly mindset, you would think that what God would do would be ask Moses and Aaron and the people to take a poll of the surrounding nations and find out what kind of meeting they would come to, what kind of service they would enjoy, what kind of music, how many people would be in the choir and how many would be playing instruments and what sorts of instruments would be used. Take a poll, Moses, find out what the Amalekites want. Find out what the Canaanites want. Find out what the Jebusites want. And then build your service for those who are seeking to worship me. That's not what we find. We find God being absolutely specific regarding his worship. And it's that way in both the Old and the New Covenant. It is not within our authority to say we will worship according to our desires, according to our wants. We will say how services shall be. Now God says this is what you'll do. You'll have the public reading of scripture. You'll worship me in spirit and truth. You'll, as Colossians says, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. All of these instructions come to us in both old and new covenants as if God is saying it's my way or the highway. In fact, there was a couple, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, who in Leviticus 10 brought what they thought was innovative worship, something that was cool, a little bit different, kind of pushing the boundaries, and God called it strange fire and killed them. He killed them. That's how serious God takes worship. When we look at this concept of Uh, what God requires of his people, it's not our job to come up with innovative ideas, but to search the scriptures to find out what God has decreed and commanded. In fact, Exodus 25.40, as we've read, is actually repeated in the New Testament in Hebrews 8 and verse 5. When you and I look at the New Testament, when we look at the documents of uh, Paul and Peter and John and we uh, look through the words of the scripture, conspicuous by its absence is Paul or anyone else saying, tell me about your music. What kind of music are you using? Let, let, let's get, have a desire to have this by November, uh, this by next year. Can, can you go for that? And, and what's your five-year plan? Tell me, what's your five-year plan for the growth of this church? Have you ever read the Bible and read what it doesn't talk about as well as what it does? When we look at today's church, I'm inundated every day with emails from particular companies within Christendom that will guarantee that the church will reach a certain size by this time next year if I will just simply go through their program and implement it. You don't see that in the New Testament. You don't see Paul saying, okay, you're at 200. What's your plan to get to 400? Come on, guys. I'm the apostle. I'm going to watch. Give me a letter back that tells me your plan. None of that. It's you be faithful. Find faithful people who will be able to teach others also. What? What I've told you. Let there be generations. Me, Paul, teaching you, Timothy. You find faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In other words, Paul, Timothy, the people that Timothy teaches and then the people that those people teach. Four generations. And that's the way it was. Discipleship. Uh, The lifting up of the true word of God. The reading of the scripture. The preaching of the scripture. And it's as if God says, it will be my way. Just like it was in the tabernacle. And what I've said to you already is radical. It's not what is currently out there. God-centered worship. Worship according to Him. Teaching the people. Is there a God-centered education going on? Is there discipleship happening? 
We've asked this question in your notes, what is a Reformed Church? And you might wonder about that, because you and I didn't come into Christianity, hopefully, to just have a label stuck on us. I didn't come into uh, the Christian faith to be Reformed. I wanted to be a Christian and a follower of Jesus because God had worked in my heart and I wanted eight seconds after God regenerated what I didn't want before. I wanted Him. I wanted His will. I wanted His Word. And I didn't know what all of that meant when someone at the end of the service, after I'd walked the aisle, signed the card, someone said, come back next week. We'll see you next week. I thought, really? I've done everything I need to do, haven't I? I've raised my hand. That was, that was hard for me as a shy person. Uh, and walked in the aisle. And, and, and people saw me do it. And sign a card. And you're asking me to come back? I didn't know that there was a relationship between Christ and and his church, and I certainly didn't know how God regulated what his church should be. But when we ask a question, what is a Reformed church? What I'm asking is, what is a Biblical church? I substitute the word Reformed with Biblical. When someone tells me I'm becoming more and more Reformed in my thinking, I translate that as, they're becoming more and more Biblical in their thinking. If the Bible doesn't teach Reformed theology, I don't want it. I want to believe the Bible. How about you? I want to be under the Word of God. I don't want to have a label thrown at me and stuck on my head and me to say, I I'm just Reformed. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm Reformed. <laughs> no, I want to be under Scripture. But I find that as I read Scripture, I've re I find a Reformed message. You see, the Reformation, which is where we get the word Reform, was a back-to-the-Bible movement. It was a movement that says, throw out the garbage, throw out the idolatry, throw out the falsehood, the traditions of men, and let's get the Scriptures into the hands of ourselves and the people, find out what God has said in His Word, and come under it. And let that be the church in the community. Let every church in the community be a reformed church under the teaching of Scripture. We are not over it because the church didn't give birth to the Scripture. It's the Scripture that gave birth to the church. It's the Word of God that has brought forth the church. When we recognize that, we recognize the church is a miraculous thing. It's a supernatural thing. It's not something devised of men. And so you can't produce it by the act of men or by simply good marketing techniques. You can maybe get a crowd, but to get a church, you know what you need? Christians. And for that, you need the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Word of God. Without that, all you have is a crowd. And Jesus said, I will build a crowd. No, he didn't. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand up against it. And I want to see a church. I want to be part of a church because Christ still loves the church and gave himself for her and he's watching over his bride to beautify that bride and see it throughout the ages come under his rule by the sovereignty of his scepter, which is his word. Jesus made various promises to the apostles that the Holy Spirit will come and will lead you into all truth. And what we understand as Christians is that the church does not just comprise of those people who've come to Christ in our generation. But through the ages, God has had a people. There's, uh, sometimes there's just been a small uh, remnant of people, but throughout the church age, from the time Jesus died and rose again to this present time, there has been pockets of people throughout the earth who wanted what God said at the cost of their lives sometimes. Sometimes it was easy, but many times it was hard to stand for the truth of God. And God has, throughout the ages, had people who believed the biblical message of salvation, the biblical truth about God. To have the idea that God has only uh, left this next generation and our generation to be the people of truth is to have what we would call theological snobbery. To look down our noses at people in the past say they, they didn't have it. God's starting fresh with us. No, He didn't. Jesus promised He would lead His people into all truth. And so there's a recognition that in church history, though it's not a perfect history, there are warts, there are things that are blemishes and blotches on the history of the church. God has still, throughout the course of history, had a people devoted to Himself. He promised that. He is and has been and will 
continue to build his church. So I want to be biblical, how about you? I want to just believe what the Bible says. That's our starting point and we don't want labels and yet labels can be helpful if they're understood. Uh, many people say, hey, you know, I don't, want, I, don't want to, I don't want to have a label put on me. I don't want to put a self-imposed label on myself. I, I get that. I understand that. I just want to believe the Bible. But there's a problem with that because there are cults out there who say the same thing. You ask them, what do you believe? They say, we believe the Bible. All right, well, what do you believe the Bible teaches? That's when the wheels fall off the wagon and we realize they don't actually believe what the Bible teaches. They believe something else. Jehovah's Witnesses say they believe the Bible, but it's a different God, a different Lord Jesus Christ, a different way of salvation. Same with Mormonism and as they're called, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's not close to the true God. Do you understand this? Because they have the idea of polytheism, many gods, poly meaning more than one, Islam is closer to Christianity than Mormonism because at least they believe in one God. That's quite a shock, isn't it? It comes under the name of Christianity in some people's minds, but they don't even start with the right definition of we believe in one God. They don't even go there. They believe that God, the God who rules this planet, was once a man and he had a father and mother and he had a God before him and 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 they believe in this eternal progression of gods. It flies in the face of what the Bible says. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God, the psalmist said. He didn't have a beginning. He always was. He's the great I am, the Alpha and Omega. So you believe the Bible? Great, but the cults do as well. The question is, what do you believe the Bible teaches? And the moment people start answering that, they're making a creed. They're professing a creed. They're saying something. Do you know, even the idea, I don't believe in creeds, is a creed. As funny as that sounds. Many have told me that when they first came into King's Church, the service like we had today and are having today, it just seemed weird. Weird. Wow, weird. That's only because we, the people of the West, are pretty ignorant of church history. We think church history began with Billy Graham, and that's really where it all started. Um, hmm, not at all. In fact, when we come to understand something of uh, the Christian history, even in America, what is, you may have been exposed to for 20 years is weird. I have brought with me the, a copy of the Bible that came over on the Mayflower. It's not the original, it'll be worth millions. <laughs> but this is a copy of it, the Geneva Bible. It came over on the Mayflower. This was the first Bible that came to the shores of America. And in the notes, uh, the first Bible with study notes ever in history, notes written by people like John Calvin and John Knox, and the great reformers of the continent, of Europe, and of the United Kingdom. And that's our history, and so anything else is weird. Wow, that's weird. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. It seems weird because we're ignorant people. And we think church services should be start with some guy in jeans with a guitar saying, how are you all feeling? Get your praise on. And it's about us and your feelings and how you're feeling. Are you in the right mood? Let me set the right mood for you rather than the call to worship where God says, it's Sunday. Come, people of God, and worship me. That's the reason that there are things like church bells all around certain parts of America and through Europe. It's the ringing of the bells saying to the people in the community, now's the time to gather to worship. We're about to herald in the presence of God, come as the people of God, hear his word and respond in joy. Well, that sounds a little dingy to us. But that's Christian history. 
So when we ask, what is a Reformed church, we're asking the question, what's a Biblical church? Again, I don't like labels, but when we come to the cults and they come to your house, you often want to just cut to the chase rather than saying, do you believe the Bible? They'll say yes. Uh, what do you believe the Bible teaches? They'll say, we believe it teaches this about the answer. No, no. What do you believe the Bible teaches about God? Do you believe in the Trinity? And oftentimes they'll respond by saying, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. To that I say, the word Bible is not in the Bible. <laughs> but the concept is, that there is one God who's eternally existent in three divine persons and anything else is a false God. So we have to give definitions and creeds because in one word, Trinity, I've summed up an entire paragraph of theological discourse. I could say to a Jehovah's Witness, do you believe in the one true, eternal, self-existent, immutable, and on and on and on. The, the God of the Bible, do you believe that he's omniscient? And uh, the, the, <laughs> I, I could lose them and me by the end of the sentence. One God, eternally existent in three persons. That's still a mouthful. But it's summed up in one word, Trinity. I can say at my door, do you believe in the Trinity? Knowing that if they are Jehovah's Witnesses, they will say no. I would say, that's the starting point. Forget about prophecies right now and getting it wrong. You got it wrong about 1975 and the end of the world. We could talk about that for hours. But the bigger issue is, who's God? If you get it wrong there, it doesn't matter if you get prophecy right. It doesn't matter. You're serving the false God. So it is with Mormonism. And so it is. We say in the word Trinity, there is one God who is eternally existent in three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you believe in the Trinity? And in one word, I've summed up what could take a whole paragraph. So these labels are helpful. And we say, as King's Church, we are Trinitarian. We believe in the Trinity, not because we're holding to some dogma out there somewhere. No, we receive that as the teaching of Scripture because that's what we find in the biblical text. I want to be biblical, and to be biblical is to be Trinitarian. Amen. So what is a Reformed Church? There on your notes, a Reformed Church is Catholic, Evangelical, and Reformed. All right, start the car, Mildred. We're out of here. I don't like that word Catholic. We're out of here. <laughs> Catholic, what does it mean? Well, we're using it in a lowercase sense rather than an uppercase sense. And it means Catholic, universal, referring to believing in the ancient ecumenical creeds of the church held by all Orthodox Christians historically. The Apostles' Creed is one of those creeds. The Nicene Creed. The Athanasian Creed. And it will be the case that you can enter a number of different denominations and hear those recited. Usually the first two. The Athanasian Creed is not usually conducive to public worship. It's uh, more technical. But we uh, affirm the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed knowing that there's still more to say. But that's the starting point. I remember an outreach taking place in the city of Phoenix and a number of churches were getting involved and we were going to get involved and they set the bar like this to be involved and to be receiving those who may be converted at this event you know as people walk forward in a the service they are uh, filling out cards and then they're assigned different churches to be part of that to be on the list of churches you must adhere to the Apostles' Creed that's the first time I'd heard it used in that sense. And there were 57 churches involved until that was proclaimed, and the 57 became 55. And I thought, that's good. If they can't affirm the basics of who God is and who Jesus is, they're not Christians no matter what else they believe about end-time prophecy. We need to understand that. And so two dropped out, and I thought, that's good. You see... Not only does doctrine divide, but it unites. And we can have a joint meeting with people that would affirm at least the Apostles' Creed. Is there more to it? Yes, there's a biblical gospel. The biblical gospel isn't outlined in the Apostles' Creed. We know that. 
Same with the Nicene Creed. It does not mention sola fide, justification by faith alone. But if we're not agreed on what God is, who God is, who Jesus is, there's no basis of the gospel anyway. So the word Catholic refers to universal. And Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, although they have a problem with one of the phrases, we'll not get into that. Anglican, Episcopal, Lutheran, Methodist. You can go into a number of these places and hear those creeds recited. I love the fact that it's explained in our service why we're doing what we're doing. We're saying, church, what do you believe? We're not gathered here to worship some strange God. This is the God that we're here to worship. One God in Trinity. Creeds and confessions never rise to the level of Scripture, but are faithful historical summaries of what the Bible teaches. Just uh, about a year ago, there was a guest speaker I knew who was from India. I'd spoken uh, and preached for him a number of times, four times in India, and he was coming to the valley and was preaching in a particular church. And I was interested as to where he was going, and looked up their website and I was confused because they were one of these churches that made up their own statement of faith. That can be good, but usually not the case. Why? Because the statements of faith, the creeds and confessions of the church have been worked out over centuries rather than over coffee one night when you wanted to fill a page on the internet. And so I read a certain... uh, description of who God is in, on the website and I thought, you know, that's confusing. That's blurring the issue. There's someone who could be a modalist. Don't, we're not going to get into what that is except they believe that uh, God has, um, rather that God is not three in person but three in manifestations and the idea is that sometimes He acts as Father, sometimes as the Son, sometimes as the Holy Spirit but uh, he's not three persons as the one God. And so I wrote an email to the pastor and I said, uh, 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 can can I just ask the question? I didn't give away the fact that I was a pastor. I said, uh, are you modalist or are you Trinitarian? And there was a long delay in response, I think three weeks. But then a response came and said, we are Trinitarian. And I said, do you realize that your statement of faith could be read and affirmed by all modalists. And uh, he took another look at it and he said, you're right, I'll have a word with my secretary and we'll change it to be more clear. And I thought, that's great, that's good. But you see, when you've got creeds and confessions of the church that have uh, lasted for centuries, it's because they've worked out what Scripture says and they've been very precise. Creeds can be less precise Confessions go into much more detail usually. That's why confessions of faith are longer than creeds. If we were to recite the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith every service, it would be a long service. (laughs) We don't do that. So creeds and confessions, they affirm God as Trinity, the full deity and humanity of Christ, the sinlessness of Christ, the atonement of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the coming of Christ again. So in that sense, we would say we're Catholic with a small c. In fact, if someone can't affirm the Catholicity of their faith, they're not true Christians. They believe in a different God. And as we go through these things, you'll see it's almost like a funnel. Uh, broad and wide at the top, becomes, uh, but it becomes narrower the more time we take in affirming and describing what it is a Reformed and Biblical church is. The second word is evangelical. That's not usually a word I'd use now because there is such confusion as to what that means. I've heard of evangelical Catholics and by that they mean Roman Catholics and that just means an aggressive Catholic who's trying to evangelize. That's not what the historical meaning of the term means. In uh, terms of historic uh, usage, which is what I'm talking about, the word evangelical comes from the word evangel comes from the Greek word euangelion, which means gospel, good news, a herald of good tidings. Uh, Paul was able to write, I'm not ashamed of the euangelion, the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God 
for the salvation of everyone who believes. So historically that word evangelical was associated with the word Protestant. And again, that's like fire in today's society, in the church world. You're still protesting. Haven't you got over the Reformation? That was a, a storm in a teacup. Uh, no, it wasn't. The gospel was at stake and the reformers protested the Pope and his doctrines when they understood what God in his word said and the formal structure of the debate that raged in the Reformation was over sola scriptura, scripture alone being the word of God, or else the Pope and uh, ecumenical councils that were decreed by the Pope. Men like Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli in uh, Switzerland, later generation John Calvin, they were used by God dramatically in the greatest move of God in church history. No doubt about it. Outside of the book of Acts, there's never been a movement of the gospel like the Reformation. They proclaimed the truth of God's word in protest. They were Protestants against Roman Catholicism because they understood the biblical truth of Scripture, what it is. Nothing else rises to the level of Scripture. Let God be true and every man a liar, including popes, including uh, priests, including those who are uh, teachers in the church. Let God be true through His Word. Everyone else a liar in comparison. Historically, an evangelical would affirm the five solas of the Reformation. So we have Scripture alone, sola scriptura, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And if you were an evangelical, you believe those things. Today that term, evangelical, can mean that, but often it doesn't. And it's such a jelly-like word that I fail to use it because it doesn't really say anything. But historically the word evangelical meant you affirmed not only the Catholic doctrines we all hold dear to us as Christians, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. Based on scripture alone as the sure foundation, we're justified before God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, all to the glory of God alone. And many martyrs for the faith believe those things because they stuck to it despite the cost. Let me say this, hopefully you can follow me. All who are evangelical are Catholic, but not all who are Catholic are evangelical. Let me say that one more time. All who are evangelical, that's the second block, are under the first one of Catholic, but not all who are Catholic are evangelical. There are many who would affirm the Apostles' Creed, who deny grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. And that's where the rubber meets the road, because it's not enough to just believe in the one true God. We must believe in His true gospel. The third word is the word reformed. And here it refers to the specific beliefs of what we call reformed theology, but never at the expense of the first two blocks, the first two designations of Catholic and Evangelical. Why is this relevant to you? It's relevant because you and I, we have said, haven't we, we want to believe what the Bible teaches. And our study of Scripture has led us to be Catholic in doctrine, Evangelical in doctrine, and Reformed in doctrine. I believe these things not because I want to be quote-unquote Reformed. I want to believe what the Bible says. And I believe the Bible teaches what we call Reformed theology. I don't need Mr. Calvin to be Reformed. When I wrote my first book, 12 Whatabouts, Answering Objections, to God's sovereignty. I purposely looked it over many times to make sure the name John Calvin wasn't in there. I didn't want people to say, oh, he's mentioned Calvin, I'm not interested. People have such an obscure and they've heard so many things about the man that are usually untrue that it's just better not to use his name. Just go to the biblical text. If we can't find the doctrine in the scripture, again, we don't need it, right? We don't want it. We just want what scripture says, what Jesus said. And as we found in John chapter 6, he's a Calvinist. <laughs> 
What do I mean by that? Well, that little phrase, Calvinist, is kind of a subsection of what we call Reformed theology, and it usually refers to what Calvin and others taught regarding salvation. There's a technical theological word, you may have come across it, called soteriology, from the Greek word soter, which means to save. And so soteriology is the doctrine of salvation. And in that sense, I would be described as a Calvinist. Do I like the phrase? No, uh, not at all. In fact, I think the person who would most hate the phrase was John Calvin. He would not want people to be followers of him. And that's what often is assumed. That's why I don't use it. Oh, you're a follower of Calvin. No, 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 no not, not really. I disagree with him on a few issues, actually. It's not like Calvin has spoken. <laughs> I must submit. No, what happened was Martin Luther was raised up by God in the Reformation and he kind of sparked the Reformation with his 95 Thesis in Wittenberg on the church door. But later on, after he had basically used uh, his preaching like a shotgun and went after the Pope and his doctrines and taught many of the same things Calvin did, but in a kind of shotgun manner. He blasted in a sermon, this guy, that guy, this doctrine, that doctrine. He was amazing, mightily used of God, but a totally different personality from John Calvin. John Calvin converted about the age of 25. At age 27, started writing... Calvin's Institutes. And this was the first time the doctrines of the Reformation were systematically written down so that the truth about God was on the page. The truth about salvation was on the page. Eventually, he would come to talk about what he's known for, predestination, election, and all those things. But that was kind of at the end of all of this. And you and I would look at this and we would think that's amazing. A 27-year-old could write this well. He made a number of additions to his institute as he lived over a number of uh, years. He came to the final installment of what we would call Calvin's Institutes. But when persecution was taking place, people would ask, are you a Calvinist? And what they meant by that was, do you believe the doctrines espoused in Calvin's Institutes? That's all it meant. It didn't mean they were a follower of Calvin. But Calvin was tremendously used by God to look at the scripture and write down in a systematic way what the doctrines of the Bible were. And so in a short phrase, Calvinist, which he never started, people were able to say, do you believe the Trinity? Do you believe Calvinism? Do you believe the Calvinist doctrine? And everyone understood the doctrines that are found in Calvin's Institute. And that was the book of the Reformation because it summed up what the doctrines were of grace alone and these wonderful truths. You might have heard that term Calvinist. It's not a word I like to use, not because I'm ashamed of it, but because it's often misunderstood. I once wrote this, I have no desire to be a Calvinist in the Corinthian sense of the word. Remember where we read of, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Calvin. I don't want to be a Calvinist in that sense. I believe Calvin was tremendously used by God, had a great insight. He was an expositor of the scriptures, which uh, had, was an amazing blessing to the church. But I don't believe he was infallible in any way. C.H. Spurgeon said this, I love it. There is no soul living who holds more firmly to the doctrines of grace than I do. The doctrines of grace are those five points of Calvinism, as they're called, which was a response to what was the remonstrance, the remonstrating, the arguing of a people called Arminians. You may have heard that term. Followers of the doctrines of Jacob Arminius. And they had five things they disagreed with strongly, brought it to the Dutch church. They had a session at the Synod of Dort, a town called Dortrecht in the Netherlands, and they hashed it out and they came back as a response to the five objections with the five points of Calvinism. You may have heard a, an acronym, or um, not an anachronism, the uh, acrostic, the, the acrostic tulip, T-U-L-I-P, and that's just simply a memory device. I don't like it because it doesn't always communicate what we're trying to communicate. 
but it is T, total depravity, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement, which sounds terrible, but it's actually a wonderful thought when you understand it. Irresistible grace is the I, and P is the perseverance of the saints. Believing those things to be what uh, Scripture teaches, they affirm those five points. And so, when someone is a Calvinist, they are believing the five points that came out of that synod of Dort, the church council, at Dort, and they would say, I believe those things. But Reformed theology is much broader. John Calvin never summed up his theology in five points. And nor do Reformed people. Why? What do we do? We say we're Catholic, we're Evangelical, and we're Reformed. Don't forget those first two blocks of truth. What is it about Reformed theology that stands out? Well, there are those particulars about the doctrines of grace, but R.C. Sproul was once asked, what is it about Reformed theology that stands out from other theologies out there, other ways of understanding God? And he said, it's our doctrine of God. He said, in one sense, there's nothing unique about our doctrine of God, but in another sense, there is everything unique, because on page one of our theologies, we talk about God's sovereignty, and his imminence and his omniscience and his all-powerfulness, omnipotence, and all of those things that we list as the attributes of God. And by page 32, we're still remembering it. When we come to this doctrine, we still affirm the sovereignty of God. When we talk to the nature of man, we haven't forgot on page 39 what we said on page 1. I thought that's a very good insight. So Spurgeon said this, there's, nothing, there's no soul living who holds more firmly to the doctrines of grace than I do. And if anyone asks me whether I'm ashamed to be called a Calvinist, I answer, I wish to be called nothing but a Christian. But if you ask me, do I hold the doctrinal views which were held by John Calvin, I reply, I do in the main hold them and rejoice to avow it. I'm with Spurgeon on that. It's actually unfortunate that a man's name was associated with the doctrines that came out of that Protestant Reformation. John Calvin was not the first to articulate these things, but he was the one who systematized those doctrines. There's very little in Calvin that wasn't first in Luther. There was very little in Luther that was not first in St. Augustine. And there's certainly nothing in Augustine that wasn't first in Paul and Jesus and John and Moses and the Psalms. So it is. I've actually been to Geneva and uh, where John Calvin pastored and his church is still standing there, but you cannot find his grave. It was his request that his grave site would not be marked because he did not want adulation and religious ceremonies taking place over the top of his grave. So to this day, though you can have a tour of Geneva, no one knows where he was buried. It's very hard to find a single evidence outside of his letters about his conversion or about any personal story of Calvin. When he preached, he went to the text, spoke about the text, gave illustrations of the text, applied the text. Very little about Calvin. Very hard to find a personal story. He was not one who would want anyone to be a Calvinist. He wanted people to understand the truth of God's Word. So it is. People have false ideas. Calvinism destroys evangelism. No, 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 no. It's divine election and understanding it that gives fuel to evangelism. God has his sheep everywhere. In every tribe, tongue, people and nation. And historically, that was what birthed the missions movement in this country and from England. It appeals to the pride of man. No, no, no. When you understand that there was nothing in us that was the cause of God's choice of us, it's very humbling. It doesn't keep pride to a minimum, it destroys it. There's nothing in us that God says, oh, I see that in you, that's good, I'll choose you because of this. Or I see you making a wise and good choice, I'll choose you based on your ability to choose the right thing. No, we were dead in trespasses and sins, and God made us alive. Mark Webb said this, God intentionally designed salvation so that no man can boast of it. He didn't merely arrange it so that boasting would be discouraged or kept to a minimum. He planned it so that boasting would be absolutely excluded and election does precisely that. Election, understanding it, promotes holiness because we don't know who the elect are except that they come to Christ and live holy lives. 
If there's nothing in us that wants holiness, there should be alarm bells going off in your and my mind to say, something's wrong. Am I truly His? If we can live in sin and delight in sin, there's something wrong. The true Christian can and does sin, but he does not enjoy his sin. He repents of it. We're not merely robots. We're creatures made in the image of God. But the Bible says that our will is ensnared. Unless the Son makes you free, you will not be free indeed. Martin Luther said, If anyone does ascribe of salvation, even the very least to the free will of man, he knows nothing of grace, and he's not learned Jesus Christ aright. As I say, nothing much in Calvin that wasn't first in Luther. Whitfield was again a champion of this. So it is in our day. Let me quote Spurgeon again. I do not come to this pulpit hoping that perhaps somebody will of his own free will return to Christ. My hope lies in another quarter. My hope is that my master will lay hold of some of them and say, you are mine and you shall be mine. I claim you for myself. My hope arises from the freeness of grace, not the freedom of the will. Free will carried many a soul to hell, but never a soul to heaven. And that's why our boasting is in God and in the cross and in the work of Christ alone. And this actually speaks of a God of love. Now, let me say this. You might have come to church today and you say, I've, this is all kind of new to me. I, and, and I said, that's, that's kind of why we're doing what we're doing, to kind of help people understand these things. But many Christians, while they are Catholic in believing the truth about who God is and who Jesus is, and they're evangelical in the sense that they believe the solas, at least, of the Reformation, they're not sure where they stand on these doctrines of grace. Let me just say, you might be on your way in these things, and that's perfectly fine. I know in my own life I didn't come to understand these things quickly. I was taught other things, and the tradition was very strong. It took a number of months before I came to see what the biblical position was. So you might lean towards these things, but you might have a bunch of questions. Let me just say, that's okay. It's more than okay. To me, a member of King's Church, we simply want to embrace true Christians who believe in the true God and the true gospel plus nothing. But what you're going to hear proclaimed are the doctrines of grace because we believe the Bible teaches them. So you'll hear that, but we don't insist that everyone has to be a Calvinist. No, just be a Bible-believing Christian. But exposed to God's Word, we believe that's what you're going to find. What is Reformed Church? It's a church that holds the doctrines of grace and something called covenant theology. We believe that's the way the Bible has come to us, in the form of covenants. So, to hold to Reformed theology regarding salvation does not make a church Reformed. There are many churches where the pastor and the elders will hold to what God says about salvation in terms of Reformed theology, but that's as far as it goes. But to be a Reformed church means much more than that. It means that we are confessional. By that, we are holding to a confession that arose out of the Reformation. For Presbyterians, that is the Westminster Confession of Faith that came before uh, the next one I'll mention, which is the second one, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. And there's great sections of this second one that takes word for word the words of the first one, the Westminster, because they were saying, we're in alignment, we're in agreement about who God is, what the Scripture is, and on and on and on and on we go. It's interesting. In your notes, never are creeds and confessions to challenge the Scripture, but merely act as a very helpful tool to summarize and synthesize the Bible's teaching. Never is the purpose sectarianism. That's exclusive, excessive attachment to a particular sect or party, especially in religion. We're not after that. But rather doctrinal consistency and unity, announcing what the church has and continues still to believe to be the revealed truth of God. It's interesting, the church, the Reformed Church, outlined what they believed to be three marks of the true church. One was the gospel, the word, rightly proclaimed. Number two was the sacraments, that's the uh, communion, the Lord's Supper, and baptism uh, done biblically. 
And thirdly, which is interesting, church discipline. They believe in church membership and therefore church discipline and without that there could not be the church uh, that is true because there's no protection for the, for the sheep. Rightly understood. How many understand anything can be abused? Money can be abused. That doesn't mean you don't want some. Amen? So it is with church discipline. And the reformers believe unless that is in place, unless you can do Matthew 18 in a church, Jesus uh, command as to how to solve issues in relationships. Tell it to the church. If they won't hear the church, put them out of the church. Let them be like a tax collector. That process that is there in play from Jesus, unless that's there, you see it in 1 Corinthians 5, other places as well, unless that is in place, there's no protection for sheep and therefore not a place they would, would be willing to send the sheep under no shepherd's guide. So it is. There's also a commitment to what we call the regulative principle of worship. I have a, uh, a booklet with me. It's going to be on the back table called The Regulative Principle of the Church by Sam Waldron. It's a new uh, booklet. It's been written. Very helpful. And it's really this idea that churches should only do what God has commanded. It's really, as I talked to one theologian a couple of months back, maybe three or four months back, about what the regulative principle was. He says it's basically something that says, Pastor, you have no right to bounce orange beach, beach balls down the center of the church just because you take a fancy to that. It's to keep us from doing things that are grievous to God and to regulate our worship according to the divine Word of God. It's to do things, all things, according to the pattern shown to us on the mountain, the pattern shown to us in Holy Scripture. Worship that is acceptable to God adheres only to what God has commanded rather than merely what God has not expressly forbidden. Well, God never said we shouldn't bounce beach balls, so maybe we can do it. No, we don't want to go there. Because God has not commanded that. So, why would we even talk about this today? Because I believe it's important for us to understand historically where we stand. We've walked into what might be considered weird to some, but it's actually weird to not be this. This was historically the case, that a church existed for God and for His praise and for His people rather than be set up to try and simply win the world. What will the world come to? Do we want to reach the lost? Yes. How? By the means of the Word. And Christ's sheep, even amongst those in the world, there are His sheep. They will hear His voice. But let's make sure the service is filled with the Word of God so that we see the Word, sing the Word, proclaim the Word in all of its fullness. And God's people amongst the world will hear it. Faith comes not by the right music and the right mood being set, but faith comes by the hearing of the Word of Christ, the Word of God, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So I hope in talking about this, this is more than merely a data dump where you get a lot of information, but that you are fortified in your faith to say, God, I'm a disciple of Jesus, I've got my Bible, and I want to do in church what I do the rest of my life in worship, come under your word. Your word is everything to me. I'm submitted to it, not looking down on it, judging it. It judges me, and I want to be under it. And a true church will be under the word of God. Let God be true. Every other man-made idea, a liar. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these truths. We thank you for the truth of God. And we recognize we are prone to idolatry. The human heart is a factory of idols, as Calvin said, and we are prone to wander. Lord, keep us on track to believe that you have not only uh, given us life now, but you've been with your people throughout the centuries. The saints, men and women, boys and girls, through the ages have paid sometimes the ultimate price to have a Bible in their hands, to say the Lord's Prayer, to recite the Ten Commandments, to have the Word of God in their own spoken tongue, and to come under its rule. And Lord, we recognize that you have birthed the church by means of the Word of God, and that you will nurture us and sanctify us by that same Word. Lord Jesus, you prayed, sanctify them, that's the elect people of God, 
sanctify them in your truth your word is truth and may our church be one of the many that you're raising up in this city in this valley in this country and in this world that will say Lord we're yours we want to obey you we submit to you and your word we thank you in Jesus name Amen Amen